Uh, my name is Vivian Welch. I'm uh, Editor-in-Chief and Interim CEO of the Campbell Collaboration. And I'm uh, really delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Ranjitha Buskur and Avni Nushra, um, who will be speaking to us about enhancing resilience uh, of women farmers through climate smart agriculture, the role of evidence synthesis. And uh, this is the first of our 2022 webinar series that um, is really focusing on uh, partnerships for uh, evidence synthesis um, uh, and the Campbell collaboration. Um, so I'll introduce both speakers first, and uh, we have one slide set that um, they will both present. Um, we invite you to uh, place uh, comments in the chat uh, at, during the presentation, if you wish. And we'll hold um, you know, uh, question and answers until the end of both presentations. Um, and we'll, uh, you can unmute yourself to ask questions or use the chat. Uh, and we hope uh, to have a good discussion. So um, Dr. Ranjitha Puskur is uh, the Evidence Module Leader uh, and Gender Research Coordinator at the International Rice Research Institute. Um, she leads the CGIAR Gender Platform. Um, uh, which is on gender and livelihoods at the International Rice Research Institute. Uh, and she is in the Institute, International Rice Research Institute's representative to India. Uh, she's been with the Consultative Group for International Agricultural Research since 2002, uh, working at the International Water Management Institute, the International Livestock Research Institute, uh, World Fish and Erie. And her work focuses on generating knowledge, learning, and evidence that can translate into technical and institutional innovation and lead to more equitable outcomes for women and other vulnerable social groups in agriculture. Um, she, uh, as I mentioned, she leads the evidence module and she'll begin the presentation today. And um, Avni Mishra uh, is an associate scientist at the CGIAR gender platform. Um, She's the program coordinator uh, of the evidence module uh, based in New Delhi, India. And at the CGIAR gender platform, Avni is supporting the climate change and gender agenda by coordinating gender and climate change hotspots project and development of a learning agenda for climate smart agriculture and gender. Uh, she's assisting projects that seek to understand government and multi or bilateral support to women in agriculture based livelihoods affected by COVID-19 in African countries. And Avni has a Master of Science in Climate Change from the Institute of Development Studies, uh, University of Sussex, and uh, MSW in Rural Development from Tata Institute of Social Sciences. And she completed her Bachelor's in History from the Delhi uh, University. And without further ado, I will Pass to uh, Dr. Puskur, who I think you will share your screen. Thanks, Vivian. Um, yeah, good day, everyone, um, wherever you are, whichever part of the world. Um, so, um, so today we're going to talk about um, you know, the kind of evidence synthesis that the CGIAR gender platform has been undertaking with a focus on climate smart agriculture and gender and how that could be used to enhance resilience of women farmers. Um, so I'll say a few words about CGIAR, though I see a lot of uh, colleagues and partners who know CGIAR well enough in the participants today, but nevertheless, I'll very, very quickly run through some of the stuff. So CGIAR is a global network of 12 agricultural research centers, and they have a presence in 89, local presence in 89 countries and work across the developing world. And we work with more than 3000 partners, including national governments, academy, academia, research um, institutions, global policy bodies, private sector and NGOs. And we have about 50 years of experience in innovation and conducting world-class research to address development challenges in agriculture and food systems. Um, and then the CGI, the mission of the one CGIAR of all these network, this network of global research centers together 
is to end hunger by 2030. And how do we do that? It is through science uh, that will help transform food, land, and water systems in a climate crisis. That is the biggest crisis that we are facing today. And, and it's obvious as we look around us every day and it's only getting worse. So the gender platform, I'll say a few more things about it, it which it is an impact platform as we call it as part of the CGIAR and its vision which feeds into the CGIAR mission is about a world, we are envisaging a world where gender equality drives that transformation that we need towards food systems that are not just climate resilient and productive and sustainable, but also equitable. <clears throat> we see two pathways that, you know, where it isn't just about gender equality driving food systems, but these transformed food systems or, or as they are transforming, they also actually support gender equality so that it's a win-win um, situation that we are talking about. And, and a few words about the CGIAR gender platform itself. Gender is actually an acronym. So this is about generating evidence and new directions for equitable results. So evidence is front and center in the work that we do. And it is, as I said, an impact platform, and we'll talk about what that means. And we work with researchers across the CGIAR, across these different um, centers, research centers that we are talking about, and a whole uh, gamut of partners to synthesize research, relevant research, impact-oriented research, amplify that, and then identify where the research and evidence gaps are and fill them, build capacity to use, to not just generate that research and evidence, but also to use that so that we are able to set direction to enable CGIAR and partners to have the maximum impact on gender equality, opportunities for youth and social inclusion in agriculture and food systems. Essentially, the platform is trying to put gender equality at the heart of agricultural research. And the work of the platform is uh, coordinated via three modules. One is called, which work very, I mean, together and then feed on each other. Uh, the methods module aims to you know, set up, set stage or lay the foundations or strengthen robust research, gender research, um, research on gender, youth and social inclusion that happens in, in, in the CGIAR. Developing cutting edge methods so that we develop, you know, we, we generate comparable data and robust research so we can draw more wide ranging lessons. And building on that, the evidence module, you know, tries and, and bring together rigorous and comparable evidence across different themes, across different contexts, um, basically so that, you know, that can be used to have an impact. It essentially focuses on, you know, the data and knowledge gaps that are needed to inform strategies to, to propel that socio, the food systems transformation that we are talking about while making sure gender equality is advanced at the same time and, and women are not left behind. Um, and then the third module called alliances, it is about you know, getting this agenda together with a number of partners, the now kind of partners that I had mentioned earlier, build capacity of the researchers within the system and then build these alliances so that the evidence that we generate gets taken up and then use so that we have bigger impact. So focusing on the evidence module itself, where we're going to present some of the things that we have been doing. Um, so the main output that the evidence module aims to do, I mean, get out is evidence on what works for women's empowerment and gender equality in agriculture and food systems particularly in the context of climate change, so that this evidence is synthesized, generated, the lessons documented, 
um, and communicate it. And then, what, so what, what is the kind of outcome that we are hoping for when we generate this evidence? We are hoping that, or we are aiming, or we are you know, um, developing strategies and implementing as well so that not just the one CGIAR, but the key actors like governments, regional bodies, donors, multilateral agencies use that evidence that is synthesized, generated, communicated on what works uh, for women's empowerment to inform the investments, the strategic investments they make. And we are also envisage that these are uh, this evidence base will be used to design and evaluate innovations and procure transformative approaches before they actually go to scale. And that you know the quality of gender research evidence that is generated is, is higher. And the ultimate outcome that we are aiming for is that, you know, this evidence that is generated and, and communicated is used to inform the strategic investments and scalable innovations and approaches, which are gender intentional, so that we get greater gender equality and inclusion in the food systems. Uh, and this done by CGIAR, government bodies, et cetera, as I mentioned about. In a nutshell, so evidence module supports uh, the development of a diverse gender research portfolio, focusing on delivering new evidence, identifying what the emerging issues are, and closing the key gender gaps. And this is all done through collaboration with the gender researchers in the system. So we work very, very closely with these gender researchers. We take a critical look at what evidence need is needed develop that evidence base and the new directions. We identify solutions and trajectories to reduce gender equality as the food systems change. If they are very, very dynamic and as they are affected by, and, and they respond to climate change and, and other drivers. So talking about climate smart agriculture and gender. So what is the context and in which, you know, we are actually talking about today? Within agriculture, I mean, we are we are all experiencing climate change. It's not anymore, you know, where uh, we are not anymore at a stage where we say, "Oh, look, climate change is going to happen and it's going to have negative consequences." Well, it's happening already. It's 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 there for us to see, and that is leading to loss of livelihoods, income, loss of ecosystems, leading to food insecurity, quite widespread. And the evidence shows that within agriculture and food systems, women are disproportionately affected by these threats and shocks that are posed by climate change. And women have some coping mechanisms, have some resilience patterns, um, but then they are very different. Women are not one homogeneous group. There is a very complex interplay of ethnicity, caste, religion, class, age, all those determine what coping mechanisms women tend to use and how resilient they are. And we also know that women play a very critical role and potentially a transforming role in addressing food and nutrition insecurity, not just within their households, but in their communities. But we also know that they continue to face the obstacles that they've faced for, for centuries, in, in, in the form of limited access to natural resources, productive assets, training, skills, knowledge, information, markets, et cetera, et cetera. And as a result, because of these limitations, they tend to actually over rely on negative coping mechanisms where there is a huge depletion of assets, both personal, but also natural. And all this has impacts on their productivity, incomes and socioeconomic development. And it is also true that they have a huge burden on them uh, to take care of you know, the domestic and activities, the unpaid care work, but then also productive activities, which are linked to climate change. And, and there is evidence to show how climate change adds to the burden of women in agriculture. So these women are not just at risk, but then they also have 
significant potential. They can be key agents of change in mitigation and adaptation, but that potential remains untapped because of all these considerations. And then climate smart agriculture, what is it? I mean, this is a set of practices and approach that aims to address food insecurity and climate change. It promotes approaches whereby you can increase agricultural production and incomes while protecting natural resources and the key ecosystems, promote resilience and adaptation, reduce your greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and then there is evidence uh, you know, that suggests not a lot, but then, for, I mean, you know, fairly thin, but then it does exist to show that climate smart agriculture can actually increase productivity of women farmers. So basically there is an urgent need to maximize the potential of this climate smart agriculture to enhance women's resilience to climate change. So the research, it is the highest research priority right now. We know there is an intimate relationship, climate change, food systems, and gender. Often women are portrayed as victims of climate change, but hey, there is a huge potential and we've seen that they can be very, very powerful agents of change in this context. And therefore, how do we maximize it? And this is an urgent challenge. We need solutions right now. The best technologies and innovation needs to be in the hands of women. They need to have access to those. They need to be capable of using those and actually benefit from using those. So there is a lot of work that is going on, be it CGIAR, be it elsewhere on climate change and, you know, um, to a certain extent on gender but it's all pretty scattered. So what we've been trying to do in the platform is to look at what's around there, get to do some synthesis, identify the gaps and actually set the agenda. So these are the various pieces that we have been working on to get to a six year research for development agenda focused on climate smart agriculture and gender. So we'll talk about a few of uh, I mean, of these uh, very, very briefly and see how they all kind of um, add up. So um, we did an evidence gap map to identify what kind of um, gaps or evidence exists. Okay. And, and then went on to a systematic review, started developing a learning agenda, uh, a new methodology for hotspot mapping. So I'll start talking about with this evidence gap map and then I'll pass it on to Avni to talk about the systematic review, learning agenda and the hotspot mapping. And then I'll come back to kind of wrap it up. So we did this together with the lead uh, university in, in India. We developed an evidence gap map on gender in agriculture and food systems. This was our very, I mean, attempt to get a broad based understanding overview of what kind of evidence exists in, in various themes that are central to the topic of gender in agricultural food systems. So we looked at some 11 themes. Uh, I don't think you can read all those on the screen, but then, yeah, we looked at those. And we looked at four major outcomes, agricultural knowledge and behavioral outcomes, economic outcomes, social outcomes, and environmental outcomes. We also looked at the various methodological approaches. Is it qualitative data and evidence? Is it quantitative or have these studies used mixed methods? Which regions of the world have these studies focused on? So to look at where the gaps are or where there is enough evidence that, you know, that warrants a synthesis. Um, and, and so in all, about 752 peer-reviewed studies were, were uh, which published during 2007 to 2021 were actually reviewed. And this is the kind of picture that we get. It, I mean, the scientific literature on gender and agriculture and food systems actually increased fourfold during that period, 2007 to 21. 
But then a majority of the studies have been in Africa, more than 50%, so all, about 52%, followed by Asia, which about 33%, but even within Asia, South Asia and particularly India and Bangladesh have a higher share of studies compared to Southeast Asia. Um, and then Latin America has few, uh, about 12%, but we must admit that we didn't review literature published in Spanish. We just looked at literature in English. So that might have been a shortcoming. And the Middle East and North Africa, actually very, very little focus and evidence from there, just about 3% of the studies. And then amongst these themes, what's relevant for us on this climate, I mean, directly looking at some of the stuff on climate change and uh, risk and resilience. Um, so this was the theme. And this essentially looked at uh, lit evidence that's available on gendered impacts of environmental change, resource degradation, shocks, migration, sudden disruptions. And then what evidence is available to show what works to improve resilience of vulnerable groups to climate change through collective action in different agroecological systems. So multiple themes in there that, that, that we looked at. Interestingly, this theme actually had the highest proportion of studies across those 11 themes that we looked at, at about 18%, but there were significant gaps. So when we looked at the lit evidence, uh, you know, it was the social outcomes that were most extensively reported, about 45%. And amongst these, decision-making has actually been the most frequently reported. So agency of women, again, which is very, very important. Agricultural knowledge and behavioral outcomes came next, and adoption was the most frequently reported uh, sub-outcome. But economic outcomes, environmental outcomes were hardly ever reported. So one thing that did come out at a you know, fairly quick high level synth I mean, review of that evidence shows that decision making or that agency was, a, was one of the key driving forces behind adoption of improved on new practices, including the climate smart agricultural practices that shows how important enhancing women's agency is if they need to have, uh, need, need to be engage in climate smart agriculture effectively for their benefit. There's be, there is very little on what type of these climate smart interventions, agricultural interventions have been effective in empowering women farmers. You know, it's, it's always been about this instrumental approach. How can we engage women to advance the ag agricultural impacts and outcomes, but very little on how these agriculture and food systems can actually empower women farms and, you know, advance gender equality. So very little on that is, is available and whether what kind of interventions can be transformative and looking across agriculture, I mean, crops and livestock, fisheries and aquaculture and so on. So with that as the basis, you know, to start us off, we realize there is a significant, I mean, you know, that there is some evidence, but we do not know uh, yet. It's, all, it's a bit scattered, patchy. So we wanted to look at, hey, what are the types of climate smart agriculture interventions that, are, that have actually been effective in empowering women farmers, enhancing their resilience in different contexts. So we commissioned a systematic review. So or we are collaborating with Campbell collaboration actually to do that. And now Avni, passing it on to Avni to take us through that. Over to you, Avni. Thank you, Ranjita. Hi, everyone. Um, as Ranjita said, I will move on to explaining the type of work that we are doing at CGI Agenda Platform with respect to the themes of climate smart agriculture and gender. Um, she already told us that we are working on a systematic review with Campbell collaboration. And the aim of that uh, systematic review is where we identify and synthesize evidence 
on the measures that have been effective in uh, that measures the effect like the evidence review measures the effectiveness of interventions and approaches which promote um, and empower women farmers in climate smart agriculture and also enhance their um, agriculture and resilience outcomes um, we are looking at interventions that were able to improve women farmers knowledge or their skills their agency decision making skills their bargaining power helped in asset uh, uh, accumulation or in improving coping mechanisms their adaptive capacities and so on uh, the sr will also examine evidence along the causal pathways from access to interventions that promote climate smart agriculture to empowering women as rindita said so that they can use climate smart practices now here interventions uh, will focus on or will include the ones that are based on disseminating knowledge or information services training financial approaches institutional approaches etc rindita next now why is this systematic re uh, review important for us uh two of the five major impact areas that one cg has dedicated itself to going forward is climate change and women empowerment therefore this CS this sr will help in generating insights that will inform the research for development agenda and activities for one cgr and our partners around the themes of climate smart agriculture and gender we also hope that this sr will provide us a consolidated understanding of what interventions work within agri food systems for women farmers and what outcomes can these interventions achieve for us the sr we hope will also inform us the assumptions that are there and the learnings that will be useful for designing programs as well as in informed and strategic decision making for us thank you rindita so the next project that we are working upon is a learning agenda on climate smart agriculture and gender so let me just tell you a brief about like what is a learning agenda and how it is done so the learning agenda is basically a set of questions that address critical knowledge gaps on different themes for us being climate smart agriculture and gender uh it is then followed by a set of associated activities that can answer these questions and then identifying products which are aimed at disseminating those findings now the la basically helps us identify broad gaps within themes and what priority questions should be adopted that address those gaps within a limited time frame and a budget um next ranjita now as we were already mentioned before the la also intends to feed into a six year strategy on what themes we want to focus upon and the priority knowledge areas that we intend to cover in order to develop uh, actionable strategies um, approaches all of which we hope will enhance synergies between development and application of climate smart agriculture gender and enhance gender uh, equality and women empowerment the la aligns with our one cgr strategy and the impact areas that cg is dedicating itself to for the next one decade and also provide research opportunities that integrate this work in their r4d agenda finally we understand that at cg we have capabilities to work on the various themes within csa and gender but we need to understand what capacities are needed to implement this agenda therefore we are also hoping that this learning agenda will highlight that for us um next ranjita so here i will detail on the process that has been adopted um uh, uh for developing a learning agenda for us on the themes of climate smart agriculture and gender uh the first step is identifying the relevant stakeholders uh, we did identify relevant stakeholders holders and we brought them together to uh, who are working in this field and who are interested in these themes um we got them together for lots of consultations we then went ahead by uh, the next step uh, was of course um, to do a literature review so we conducted a thorough literature review to identify what work has been done till now the impact that that work has created and where there are gaps and opportunities to do more work on the themes of climate smart agriculture and gender 
The next step is formulating the priority questions that we intend to uh, cover or we intend to address through uh, in the next five to six years of our um, work and how then develop activities that will help cover up those or fill up those gaps that have been uncovered through the research, like through the literature review that we did in our learning agenda journey. At this stage, the platform is working, we like in the process of uh, finalizing a priority questions and activities, and we've identified eight different sub themes on which we intend to work under CSA and gender. Um, Ranjit, the next now. Uh, Another project that we are working upon is developing a methodology for identifying climate, agriculture, and gender inequity hotspots. As Ranjita already covered, climate change is out there and it's transforming our food systems and it will impact the livelihoods of those who are dependent on it, particularly women farmers, who we believe we've seen, in fact, evidence says that they have low adaptive capacities and that has been influenced by gendered norms and barriers which drive or result in unequal access to resources uh, and assets for them, putting them at a greater risk and vulnerability to the forthcoming climate change. Um, so we, to identify hotspots, we used IPCC's risk framework where climate hazards, gendered vulnerabilities, which are resulting from entrenched inequities and women farmers exposure intersect. So women's farmer, uh, like farmers exposure to risk, all these three in um, components intersect. That is where we have our hotspots. Uh, so for the purpose of this methodology for identifying climate hazards, we used data set, uh, climate hazard type data set developed by CJR CCAPS initiative. Uh, to look at women's exposure to climate hazards, we uh, adopted the labor force participation rate database, which is given by uh, International labor, uh, labor Organization. And for gender inequality, we looked at social institutions and gender index, which has been developed by OECD. Zanjita, next. Uh, now here, if you look at the map, of inequity in uh, equity and inequality hotspots, we see that so we basically created an index where 87 countries in the global south were ranked according to their overall score. So the ones in red and bright, uh, bright orange and orange are the hotter countries, and the ones in blue are colder countries. Uh, so we see that the hottest countries, which we that is what we saw from our ranking that the hottest countries across the global south, the one that rank in 1 to 15 are all situated in Africa, which are then followed by Asia and Africa. Ranjita, next. So after that, we decided that we wanted to do a subnational analysis uh, where we, uh, and we wanted to do it at a very crop commodity specific uh, level. So we wanted to see uh, hotspots within countries on different uh, uh, crop commodities. So we uh, basically the six crop commodities that we identified, uh, I'm not sure if you can see them, it's really small. But then um, the, the, the crop commodities, uh, one was cereal legumes and all seed crops, then there was livestock, there was mixed farming, there was perennials, there was vegetables, and then there was rice. So here, for example, you can see the map of Zambia. And within Zambia, for example, we identified that the Eastern province, if you will see map A, Eastern province was, is a hotspot for cereal legumes and seed crops. Similarly, if you will see map C, the Southern province is a hotspot for uh, vegetables and for mixed farming, Central, Eastern and Southern provinces are a hotspot. Uh, similarly for perennials, uh, your Lua Pula, which is, um, Eastern Zambia, that is a hotspot. Uh, Ranjita, next. So what is the relevance of this hotspot mapping? Uh, this hotspot mapping, uh, the methodology does provide us uh, with a promising approach that supports in developing and improving targeted policies and programs that take into account both socio-agroeconomic conditions as well as climate risks. Um, secondly, it helps us um, 
since the results can be uh, are contextual in nature, it can help us prioritize responsive policies specific to locations where different crop commodities are facing specific risks to climate hazards, uh, which are high in nature. And finally, we hope that by identifying hotspots, we also identify and implement measures that do not exasperate uh, existing inequalities and improve uh, gender inequalities, uh, gender equalities in these regions. Um, I'm pass over to Ranjita again to uh, wrap this up. Thanks, Savni. Um, so you got a flavor of the different pieces of this puzzle that we are trying to put together to lead us to this agenda, which would be comprehensive and systematic so that we are able to actually have an impact through some of this work. So we started with the evidence gap map, identified where the challenges are, where the evidence is, where the gaps are, and then we are looking at what works system and systematically in, in empowering women, what kind of interventions through the systematic review, and then having identified some of those gaps and then also bringing in more stakeholder perspectives and through a very participatory process, we are developing this learning agenda on what are the important questions and gaps that need to be addressed. And that is also supported by this evidence curation, as, as we called it in the learning agenda, a summary of, you know, what, what, what do we know so far about, about this area? Looked at these hotspot mapping, where, is, where are these risks the highest for women and why? And, you know, that informs that whole geographic targeting. We are also, so we haven't done that subnational analysis for all the countries, but basically we tested that methodology for four countries, two in Africa, two in Asia. And then we are actually doing a situational analysis there, trying to understand how are the food, agriculture and food systems performing? Uh, you know, what are the challenges? How do they intersect and intercept with the gender inequity or inequalities? So getting a feel for that, but now we have a methodology that can actually be applied to other, other places. So this will, you know, we, we shall bring all this together to develop this r for d agenda that can be implemented by CGIAR or other organizations, its partners. So this will be something where people can see where they are interested in and then pick up those and then start implementing so that and, and when we talk about, we are, I'm not saying it's just a research agenda, but we are talking about a research for development agenda so that we have that impact. So putting all this information together, evidence is one thing, but then it's of no use if it is not taken up and used. And to enable that, to facilitate that, we have a fairly um, well thought through communication and engagement strategy uh, that we are working with. So there's a bunch of things that we are doing, evidence explainers, you will see that on the gender platform website, uh, policy briefs to inform policymakers. We have a, an extremely well equipped resource hub on, on the gender platform website on various themes, including climate smart agriculture. We do series of webinars, but we also participate in webinars like this. We have a regular newsletter that goes out, but all those are a bit about dissemination, pushing it out. But I think what's also, we also do strategic stuff, very targeted policy events. For example, you'll see, you're seeing on your screen, we recently did a side event at the CSW 66, and then we'll engage with the COP. Um, so to see, to get our evidence out there and get people to appreciate what is out there so that people, whoever needs to act on it actually needs to act that. But in, I mean, it, while this is all just a more, uh, you know, I, 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 taking these out at, at, a, at a large scale, we also plan very strategic engagement with 
specific groups of people with RFD community, the policy makers, the donors, given that their interests and objectives and what they could do with this evidence is, is different. So we go with that understanding of what we want out of those so that this evidence actually gets taken up, used and results in those development child outcomes that we are seeking. Thank you very much. Over to you, Vivian. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Dr. Puskur and uh, Afni. Um, that was fantastic. Uh, so much, uh, uh, so much going on, really, in your evidence platform um, with the gap map, uh, the systematic review, and the hotspots identification. Um, so we'd like to invite uh, questions in the, in the chat. Um, you can also. Um, um, just raise your hand and ask a question if you'd like to uh, ask a question. Um, I have, uh, I guess, one question um, to start off is um, I'm also involved in uh, some research on women's empowerment and uh, nutrition interventions. So I'm interested, um, Avni and Ranjitha, in how you, uh, you know, define and operationalize women's empowerment in your systematic review and in your gap map. So um, we've looked at uh, whether there's um, um, an assessment or an inclusion of uh, both improving agency and also opportunities. But I'm interested in how you define that and measure it in your your evidence and your work. Yep. <clears throat> Thanks, Vibi, and I'll um, take that and then see if Avni has anything to add. So um, I, you, you must be familiar with um, the Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index. Uh, so that is something that CGIAR has been using quite widely. And it has multiple dimensions or domains, as they call it. You know, So you're looking at agency, you're looking at mobility, you're looking at access to resources and assets, or more like control over resource and assets. So we are looking at those and opportunities opportunities as well. So looking at, and not all just restricted by those, but looking at, so we're basically looking at multiple dimensions there, but agency capabilities and um, uh, uh, access, control of, uh, access to and control of resources being the most important ones. Thank you. Avni, anything to add? So I think I too was going to talk about VIA uh, framework only and the fact that it looks at a lot of indicators that are pretty relevant to capture uh, agency and empowerment uh, uh, factors when measuring women empowerment. Uh, so we have mostly used that in our work uh, because it is, of course, uh, developed by one CG and has been very widely used. So yes, I think that's a good operational measure too. Uh, check empowerment. Great, okay, thank you. Um, I do have another question actually based on a little bit on your very last uh, slides about the dissemination and communication. Um, as you might know, um, Campbell had a recent webinar on uh, communicating bodies of evidence, which was very well attended. Um, and I think you have a very comprehensive platform. It looks like you've also engaged stakeholders in designing your evidence maps and your reviews. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how you engage stakeholders, how you identify which stakeholders to include, and then how you um, potentially um, uh, measure impact uh, of your communication strategies. Yep, thanks, Vivian. I mean, this is, uh, okay. Yeah, so we've, we've um, in the, in the um, evidence, while doing the evidence gap map that was led, uh, led by lead Korea, we actually engaged more researchers than you know um, other other um, um, partners let's say as as it was really focusing on peer-reviewed literature so we you know engaged researchers from across the CG and a few key partner research organizations to to, to scout for it and then actually provide guidance on developing that map, defining the themes and what do we look for, inclusion, exclusion, et cetera. In the learning agenda development process, we actually went a bit broader, 
you know, brought in development practitioners, researchers, academia, some representatives of donors to actually have a very um, robust dialogue on what we are seeing, what is not existing, what are the priorities, uh, and defining those learning questions and so on. Uh, that was, I mean, I think Avni, when she was talking about it, said we had a lot of consultation. It was actually an awful lot of consultation uh, that that went in of participation, which 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 made it very rich. And then I think the now, um, so we are looking at in terms of uh, participation, uh, sort of engagement when it comes to dissemination and uptake. So we are looking at, you know, the various bodies, organizations, individuals, you know, domains, which have a stake and are interested in this, in this area and then trying to map them out and then say how who, what is what are their so that is work in progress actually so what are their interests what would be the kind of things they can do and what is the kind of evidence they'd like to see and would be interested in what parts of the agenda would they like to invest in to make that you know uh, a, a reality so that's happening and then yeah, so the last question you asked, that is, I think, the trickiest one, impact of all this, you know, how do we measure the uptake? So that's something we are still grappling with, finding um, a sort of, let's say, think, thinking through, easier said than done. Uh, so we'd love to engage with Campbell and then see, you know, how we could work together on, on, on that. Thank you. That's great. I think we are still figuring that out too, Ranjitha. <laughs> um, we uh, we do capture um, you know policy influence stories. So how our evidence has been uh, used in policy to inform um, you know national discussions or to inform the development of programs. But it's uh, it's tricky to measure policy Very impact. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> Are there any questions from the um, the audience? I uh, haven't seen any in the chat. I do know there are some people on the in the audience who are not shy. <laughs> so I I do see that um, Hugh Sharma Waddington has joined us, and um, I did note one thing in your. Uh, presentation, uh, Ranjitha. Oh, are you going to ask a question, Hugh? No, I'm. I'm just turning on my video and unmuting as you you're calling me <laughs> out like this. Yeah, so great. I would like yeah, so, to share my face. <laughs> so, well, I will answer if anyone has any questions on the systematic review. <laughs> yeah, well, I noticed that you had exactly. very little studies looking at spillover effects, and I know that um, that Hugh uh, did a. A review of farmer field schools where um, there's an expectation of spillover across uh, neighboring farms. Um, so I was just curious if you could speak more about what types of spillover effects you were looking for and, and it sounds like you didn't find in these studies. Maybe Hugh, you could add to that. Do you, yeah, do you, do, okay, so it's interesting the, so thanks Vivian for um, <laughs> for making this point because you you will see um you know in in the arguments that are made for particular programs particularly those that can be quite resource intensive whether the resource intensity is on the on the program side or um on the side of the program participants themselves although that the the latter is 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 far less looked at but um, you'll, you'll see sometimes built into the the um, how the intervention is supposed to work or the, the theoretical theory of change or causal pathway, you will see that there, there, there might be some element of um, spillover effects, whether it's a kind of like assumed spillover effect in the sense that um, in, the, in the case of farmer field schools, for example, farmer those that graduated from farmer field schools in some programs were kind of just assumed to disseminate that knowledge to 
um, neighbour farmers that hadn't attended the field school. And we, and we had some questions about that, particularly where perhaps farmers were working in competition with one another, for example. Um, but but there, there were some other field schools where it, it was more explicitly built into the programme that rather than it just being assumed, they had specifically built in um, training of farmer trainers types of approaches. So so perhaps that that adds a bit more clarity to your um, question for Ranjita. Thank you. Great, thanks. Yeah, so essentially we were also looking at the, you know, what kind of, I mean, if we talk about adoption of technologies or the innovation processes and, um, you know, the impact. So we were basically trying to see how does knowledge or innovation, you know, uh, flow, or, or not so much flow, but it was about whether that would have any spillover effects compounding those outcomes and impacts that we are seeking. But yeah, we didn't see much literature on that actually. Yeah, very little. So, so is, that a, is that a case where it's simply not being measured? I think so. Yeah. I don't yeah. think it's it's a key research question in a lot of the work. So, yeah. uh, and and you know, a lot of the very traditional quantitative uh, economic impact assessments aren't also looking at that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, I think that's an important question to get added to the agenda. Uh, you know, or or it. Just so, just um, sorry, I was a bit late to your presentation. I was I was out, but but so you may have mentioned it before. But but presumably the um, underpinning some of the empowerment programs is the notion that you at least have to attend some aspects of the program that you you can't really get empowerment through osmosis or something like this. So yeah, that would make sense. Yeah. Yeah, great. I, that's that's what we're finding actually is that very few studies um, uh, even describe empowerment approaches in enough detail that you could replicate them. Um, okay, I see there's a question from Howard White. Yeah, hi everyone. So I won't turn my camera on. Uh, so Vivian, we should probably talk about empowerment. We had a meeting just before earlier on this morning about the empowerment measures we're using in both these reviews and a number of other reviews that we're doing. Um, and yes, yeah, so my question actually on intra-household intra measures. So to what extent you're finding studies that are, I mean, to what extent you're looking at studies which are specifically about women or their more general interventions, not specifically targeted at women, but you're looking at gender disaggregated effects. And in particular, in that case, the extent to which you, know, you think you've got good, a good handle on intra-household intra aspects of income and expenditure, which is, is notoriously difficult to, to get a handle on. And, and, and one question Hugh didn't ask, but he might have done when he was there, because it's his favourite topic, was part of why is, is time use and whether you are finding much time use data. And and sort of what and, and what what direction is up in time use? I was looking way this morning. We had this meeting, and it's not clear. Like, okay, what what's a good thing to look for in time use? Can women get more engaged economically? Then time use might go up there, which can be a good thing. But at the same time, it's increasing the burden. So, what what are you looking for there? Right. So um, the first part of sorry. Um, Okay, let me start with the time use. Um, uh, so yeah, sorry, the intra household decision making. Again, very little. I mean, so far, I mean, a lot of the studies that have been conducted actually looking at women and their agency and decision making, very little scholarship on intra household decision making. It's very tricky. It's emerging. Cheryl Doss has done some some significant work on that and then been trying to push that it's it's just emerging but still i think long ways to go it is tricky also the methods and how do we do that uh and and in terms of time use again that's that's really important 
there are few studies emerging. I mean, for instance, uh, I see Mo in the audience uh, who did a PhD, who did her PhD thesis on this in Bangladesh. Um, so there is there there are again methods to measure time use systematically have been a challenge, and actually the methods module the CG at the CG gender platform has actually systematically looked at what methods are being used, um, sort of made an inventory of those, analyzed those, and then came up with some you know. Uh, it's a, there is an inventory that's available on the website, but also recommendations on how these methods should improve. There is an ongoing community of practice that's actually working on that. So again, so I think the, the second part of, your, of that question relates to what Sabina asked in the chat. So does it, are women able to use that time that they saved if they have access to labor or time reducing technologies you know and then we i mean that's the thing when we we keep adding more and more burden to the women um is is that what we want maybe not but then again again there is no we cannot, there is no conclusive evidence on, on how this is all playing out. Usually I've asked this, I ask this question every time I'm out in the field and talking to women say, hey, you know, you're doing all this new stuff, but is it something you really want to do? Uh, is it not adding, a, you know, adding to your bird? And they say, no, we are doing it because we want to do this. It helps us. Um, so it's like, it's their choice. Um, and then Sabina, to your question, do we advocate for distributing the burden across men and women? Absolutely. So we are a strong believer in and promoting what we call gender transformative approaches, which is about shifting norms, influencing norms. And we men and boys have to be partners and champions in this process. I mean, these are things we cannot impose. Advocacy doesn't work. We've seen that in our experience. So that change has to come from within. That happens through a lot of reflection, discussions, and, you know, changing within those communities. And we have some pretty good examples of that happening, but a lot of good methods exist in the health sector. You guys work quite a lot on the health sector and we've been taking inspiration and methods, et cetera, from there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I think uh, the questions are just starting to come, but we are at the end of the webinar. Um, so um, I'd like to uh, thank our two speakers, uh, Ranjitha and Avni, for uh, you know uh, excellent presentation, and uh, all of you for participating. Um, and uh, I'd like to uh, also invite all of you to consider attending our future webinars. Uh, the next one is May thirty first. Um, I'm just displaying the time and place. Um, uh, so it's reducing youth offending evidence from three new systematic reviews, uh, and these include reviews on um, uh, wilderness uh, and sports um, as uh, measures to reduce youth offending. So I hope you might be able to attend and uh, thank you all for participating and look forward to seeing this, uh, this work continue, Ranjitha and Hafni.